got to be one of the most beautiful things ever written, I think. This is the G major. Prelude number five, opus 32. Coming out of number four has really left us uh, breathless and wondering what could possibly be ahead of us. It's been s such a Herculean effort getting through number four and all of the psychological implications that go with real life that number four represents. And how I ended that lesson was where there is life, there is hope. And that's what this piece is. This is new life. And with new life comes all kinds of new possibilities. And this is innocence and purity, serenity, and rapturous love. G major now starting with, if you took your triad, but Rachmaninoff is actually going to take and invert it and build on that first inversion and go back and forth. These two chords as a pair, I take it down to the root position. quintuplets for the tenor. And that's the challenge here, is to have those two voices going on at the same time. Two, three, four. It goes 12 times like that as an accompaniment, setting the scene of what? Well, what happens here if I block these chords again? this because I want to count the beats from the beginning. These are the counts. One, two, and four, four times. Three, four. One, two, three, and four. Four. Triple, a, triple, a, three, and four. Three and four and. and the rest was all triplets. And that makes a big, big difference because it makes the melodic line fluid. It makes it rhapsodic. It makes it like a dream. It's not too real. It's not too predictable. So now I'm going to play the opening melodic line. The soprano comes in as a soloist. Let's, as written, hear what this sounds like and see if you can hear the difference between the three and four and as opposed to triple, la, triple, la, triple, la, triple, la, from the top. I have to show you the technique on this, but let's first get the melody line and the rhythm of this. It could be a soloist, a singer, a soprano singer. And what I want to show you that's very helpful in playing these quintuplets in the left hand, this is about control. This piece has to sound so effortless and fluid. 
And to do that is harder than it seems. And how I like to explain this is to block your chords and see how your fingers line up with these keys because everybody's hand is different. And once you get that position fixed, look at what it is and freeze it. And these become the spokes of the bicycle wheel. They're attached to the rim and they don't move. So what moves them? Well, the wheel turning. And the wheel turning is your arm and the wrist. And everything is fluid in this piece like this. That's a great way of doing this is putting your hands on your knees and moving in counterclockwise direction with a very loose and fluid circles of the entire arm. And if you imagine your arms as having little joints here and here, another way I like to describe it is imagine you're a little marionette and you've got strings coming out of your elbows and somebody's manipulating you and moving and that is what makes the fingers play. It's a beautiful idea and it not only works technically but it builds in fluidity of your body literally in projecting the spirit of the piece, the mind-body-spirit aspect of playing which makes this so exquisite for us if we can get all three of those going at once. So that's the idea physically behind this. So let's talk about how he constructs the melody now. In the scale of G major, he's starting on the F sharp, which is the seventh scale degree, going down to the E, the sixth, the D, the fifth, and then up to the tonic G. So the pickup, three and four and a one, there is your tonic. Let's see how far up the scale he goes. There's D, body, and four and one. So that second and, three and, was the sixth. And that's the whole meaning of the piece, the interval of the sixth. The sixth, to me, is one of the most beautiful intervals. The fifth is beautiful too. It's grounded, it's anchored. We have a lot of fifths in this piece too. But when we take the sixth, it opens us just a little bit and puts that optimism and that hope, the lightness, the sunlight into the piece. The left hand too. There's the sixth, there's the fifth. This is a great way to practice and get the rhythm exactly. Triple, triple, three and four, and now for the first time the tonic in the bass. of 10 measures. Right here, this is measured by the left hand thumb, then the right hand finishes with the A, G. That's a tenor voice.
a section like that. And now I'd like to show you what I'm looking at. This is a brand new engraving that I made. I made it and I made it up. The music has never before been published to look like this. I took, because this is public domain music, I took all of the regular notes you'll find anywhere else and I put them all down but in a completely different format. And it's been remarkable what's opened up by doing this. And I did this first for myself so that I could better understand the piece and have a better system for learning and understanding really uh, all of the different sections and motives and how they all interrelate. And seeing it on this format of 11 inches by 17 inches, that's called the horizontal landscape, it's on cardstock, you get to see this long series of left-hand quintuplets, non-stop really. Now this is my lesson copy, marked up in color. Your version comes like this. Black and white, no marks. You do get the colors on another uh, supplement, which we will look at very soon. But this one shows that on our page one, I have systems one, two, and three. And if you didn't even read music, I think you might be able to see the absolute rep repetitiveness and the similarity of material. We don't get out of that quintuplet idea until right here, this measure, let's go back to my color version. Our opening melody in the soprano started on the end of the third beat in measure two, and then we had measure three, four, five, and the first part of measure six. So that really made a full four measures of, of the opening melodic theme of this prelude. Then at measure seven, it changed completely. We went out of the quintuplets in the left hand and we went into quadruples. And they sounded like this. That was the beginning of that tenor note. What we have really in here is very complicated. We have two voices, tenor and bass. The soprano has two voices also. Uh, the right hand is the soprano and the alto. So we are a four-part harmony all the way through this piece. The left hand, tenor notes and bass notes down because again this is deceptive. This is one of those pieces that sounds easier than it is. The thirds that I just played is one of three parts you need to track. The other two parts, one of them is played by just the thumb and the other one is played just with the fifth finger. So let's take a look at the notes that the thumb plays on the second sixteenth of every beat. And this is what we have. B, 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 F sharp, F sharp. The fifth finger has this part. To show you a great way of practicing this, 
I will bring out that fifth finger louder. This is not how ultimately you will play it, but this is how you will follow and get this. Let it seep into your ears and your mind and your body memory. Sixteenth notes, and they all have a little dash over the top, which is the littlest of the accents, because that is the note Rachmaninoff wants to be brought out the loudest. But it's still marked pianissimo, and that line sounds like this. And you can hear how beautiful that would be. alone so you can hear that final melodic line. That's beautiful. And if you put everybody together, major triad. There's the tonic G, there's the dominant D, B. Beautiful. Now we have another repetition of the opening material. Instead of going up the sixth, I went. And how different the. Sounds the D with the E in the bass. What is that? taking the notes of the E minor chord in the expanded form. That's the relative minor. Is he going to E minor? Is that what we're doing here, modulating? chart which you get and this is on the vertical 11 by 17 two page which is your entire piece and what I did is to tape on the back with clear plastic heavy tape all these pieces of cardstock and now you're going to see 
the genius mind of Rachmaninoff, right in front of your eyes. Where we are in the piece right now was this E minor, little bit here, measure 13. So what we had, and I put the first opening section, the four measure soprano melody, and then the two and a fourth measure fluttering phrase, closing with the tenor counterpoint, ending with the fifth. That is your opening ten measures. Now notice here that I have two green boxes and they are really almost identical of the two and a fourth measure fluttering phrase idea. And they line up. As you can see that he's constructing this big pink box that I've decided to put. The color blocking is really powerful for me because it shows me these big sections. And then I took the other pink box here, and I could see, oh yes, this is exactly the same idea. And you could see your bass notes here, the G, the G, the E, and then we're going to go down to the D, which is the dominant. And how does he get to that dominant? Well, he takes that same two and a fourth measure fluttering motive, and it starts off absolutely identically until we get to the difference. The first time it goes one way, and the second time it goes another way. And if you've watched some of these other lessons, you see he's done this before. This is uh, one of his um, compositional devices for getting from one section to the next. And you can fold this like that, and this will fit in with your other pages of your chart package, which you can get your entire chart package as digital downloads from my website, sallychristianmusic.com. Now let's take a look at this second two and a fourth measure floating phrase and see. We start here, this is measure 15 on your page two. <laughs> second time the left hand has, remember those B's I talked about that the thumb played? It has seven and finally goes down to the G. The first time it had six and then went down to two F sharps. And then the thirds to the first time, the second time it goes gorgeous. You see how he snuck that in and he set you up. The right hand also has its differences. The first time, it, starting at measure eight, goes up to E and then and if you put all of those differences together it becomes remarkably different and can be confusing. I can't tell you how many months I spent learning the difference between the first ending and the second ending. And one of the things I love about these big pieces of paper that are loose leaf is that I can actually lay my material and see, remember this is all marked up for the lesson, but you can see right here the first time and the second time. Lay them up like that and you can see exactly how different they are and you can track it so easily. It's really very, very powerful. All right, so let me now start with the last two and a fourth measure fluttering idea and how we get to that dominant. 
because now the piece really becomes rhapsodic. Voluptuous. You see that, that almost, it's, it's almost caught in the throat. Like you, you can almost not breathe here. Or ox, it's, it's like you're getting up high and you don't have quite the oxygen. You're almost getting euphoric in your mind, in your, your whole essence. You're, you're in the vapors here. You're becoming euphoric. That's how I feel when I play this, when I'm really, really inspired and let myself go. That's kind of what happens. Just, I get in an altered state. opens to me. It's so beautiful. phrases here, he now continues for six entire measures. And this now is going to be a lot to track. So let's take a look at what the right hand does here starting measure 17. The beat notes, C, B, A, B, C, B, A, G, sharp pianissimo. two identical repetitions and then where is he going? You won't believe it when we do it. But let's take the bottom note that the thumb plays now and hear that part starting measure 17. came over. 
But let's first see how we got there. Measure 17. because I was just ecstatic. You can see how much this means to me. This is everything to me. This is my life. I have spent my entire life getting to this point in music. And it has taken a lifetime. I remember when I was 18 and a famous pianist had said, oh, just stick with it because the interpretation will come. You just haven't suffered enough. You haven't lived enough. And I really took offense at that. And I thought, well, what am I supposed to do as an 18-year-old? I haven't lived all these years yet. And what I would say to you 18-year-olds and you 8-year-olds and you 4-year-olds who maybe can understand my words, don't worry about it. Just keep practicing. Develop your fingers, develop your facility. Learn as much repertoire as you possibly can when you're 18. And keep living life. And every experience you live will come out into your music. It's a silver lining indeed. But nothing is for naught. Everything will deepen your music, deepen your artistry, deepen your perspective, your depth, your compassion, and your appreciation for this unbelievable beauty. And that's how I feel about this. I cherish this music. So looking right here at page two of our satellite view, and I'm going to open it up actually so you can see that it really is just about the midpoint in the piece here. That trill was on the D, the dominant, coming out of the cadenza, having been preceded by the five measures of that rapturous tenor descent. And it's a rocking bass. E -da -de -da. Da -dee, da -dee. It's like cradling, isn't it? Cradling a baby, an infant. That's how I think of this. Cradling my precious, tender infant. That's what the triplet is in this piece. The opening soprano line is built on the triplet. Tender, exquisite love. That's what this piece is. So with this trill now...
And now we are coming to our page three. Let me back up and get this recapitulation. Just like the beginning. Now, here's the third and final time of that material. That to me is the pinnacle of the piece, that and the trill. And then the falling six. That's a ninth from the G. The A. And the six. And four. The falling six. And four. One last falling six. And one more crossover for the tenor. your page three, the most tender of moments, starting measure 30 here, just a beautiful, and the left hand has that same two patterns of chords that we had in the beginning, it changes right here. I have to tell you one little story, I debated whether I should tell you this or not, but I'm going to, because that's what it reminds me of right here. Coming up to this, this section, I'm a mother, and when my son was just an infant, and he was, wasn't even talking yet, and he looked at me, we were in the car, and I'm driving, and he's in his little infancy. And he looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, Afu, I love you. And that's what this reminds me of. It is so heartfelt. It is so tender. He must have been 10 months old. Please excuse me for getting carried away with that. I was not expecting that to overtake me like that. And that really is what love is. Real love is like that. It stays with you forever. I don't care what happens. If you've experienced that and your heart has been touched, it will stay with you forever. That these um, changes, the left hand starting at the top of page three, take the right hand and again have the soprano and the alto. I'd like to play the soprano part first. And the beats are one, two, three, four. Now it goes chromatic. And the whole step there to the E. And it starts again. Three, four, one, two, one. The lower part 
Alto sounds like this. Constant moving. This is complicated. together. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. One, two, one. Two, three, four. One. And that's how that ends. The trill this time on the tonic. Now the left hand is just as complicated as all the other parts in the piece that have the right the thumb playing one note and the bottom finger playing another note. So let me first just play it as written and see if you can hear these parts starting on the B. to the end was enormously helpful for me in finally getting my head around this piece. Rachmaninoff does this often. He will start a long phrase not on the downbeat. In this case he starts it right here with the upbeat to the third beat. And it's one, two, ha ha ha, three, four, one, two. And then the repetition, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, three, four, one, two, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, one, ah, uh, two, ah, uh, three, ah, uh, four, ah, uh, one. So he's got a displaced four beat repetition. And that's very difficult if you're not counting your beats because when you get to the end there and you jump back to here, you don't know what beat you're on. So be sure to count this at your two four measure right here measure 37, and then it's just straight 4, 4, 4 till the end. So let's put everybody together now, as you've seen that it looks like. playing. How stunning is that? 
he does a lot of that in this piece with the body, interweaving the body physically to play these things. Let's do this trill measure here. <laughs> So that is the prelude number five in G major. And there are two pairs within this cycle of 13 preludes that have the same sort of impact of, of night and day contrasts going from number four in E minor to number five in G major. And then from the great B minor number 10 into the B major number 11 has a similar psychological relationship. And so that, again, makes even more validation for playing this as a cycle because we are making a life journey here. And that's how life is, going from chapter to chapter. You have your extreme moments of bliss, and I think anybody that has a new baby feels that. I'm a grandmother now, and I just am, I'm having so much fun with my granddaughter with that same tender, tender love. It's just wonderful. And uh, so all those things that you have in your life, your, your beloved spouse, your beloved children, your beloved pets, those are the things that give us the grist for the mill with putting our real authentic feelings into the music. And that's what makes it real. That's what makes it palpable. That's what moves people when they're playing and as a listener, when you hear something really authentic. So I encourage you in your musical work to visit the things in your heart, the painful and the ecstatically wonderful because they all make your music great. I hope this has been helpful for you and thank you so much.